Um, up next, we have Lisa Asadi. She's the co-founder of She Grows Food and co-manager of Oahu Farmers Markets for the Hawaii Farm Bureau Federation. Um, the way I describe Lisa is someone who sits um, right in the intersection between farmers and consumers. And here she, she's here to share with us some ideas about the next generation of farmers markets. So help me welcome Lisa. such a wonderful forum, a uh, very needed um, night like this. Um, first off, I'd like to warn you all that I have a tendency for um, stage fright that's existed since the time I was eight, and I was asked to MC a media program at school. So I'm going to be holding on and reading from this, these pages. Um, they're kind of like a life raft right now, so please bear with me. <laughs> Okay. But when Amani asked me to speak about um, Food Stamps project that we've been working on, I have to find a way to get through it, so here I am. Very grateful to be here tonight. Uh, first of all, I'd like to, um, I'd like to take the time to um, acknowledge Gita Snyder. She's my collaborator on the EBT project. We've been working on the project for the past 10 months. She's in France right now, so she couldn't be here. But if you know Gita, you would know that she's the perfect person to be working on a program like this. She's um, deeply involved in the local food system um, movement. She's a culinary um, networker. Uh, she's also a veteran farmer's market vendor. So she's all of her work, all the work I've been talking about tonight is, is, is hers too. OK, so I, I thought I'd start talking about uh, why I'm here and I thought I'd start with a personal story because I feel like all of us do the work that we do um, it starts on a personal level. So I want to let you know that I, I grew up and I've lived most of my life in Lower Kalihi, Kalihi Kai. My neighborhood is famously low income. When I was a student at Puhale Elementary School, a majority of the students received tokens for lunch. These tokens were part of a program to help kids from financially strapped families to be able to have lunch every day. Even, in, even then, and even among kids, there was a stigma attached to receiving assistance. Every day I watched my best friend, the top student, she was a top student in our class, hide her token in her pocket. At least then, we all had pretty much access to the same food, basically the same food. Imagine what it feels like to not have access to the same food. In the past 30 years, our food system has changed drastically. Cheap, processed, imported food now dominates low-income areas. Big box stores have squeezed out the local grocery stores in their place let the store's convenient shop survive. These are what we call now food deserts. Places where it is impossible to find a fresh tomato or a cabbage, let alone locally grown. Imagine what a lifetime of not having access to healthy food does to your body and to your spirit. For people living on limited incomes, the cuts in the budget usually start at the food, right? Eating cheaper to have more, which means more processed food, which means more imported food, especially the starch, the sugar, the oil. And it's all translating into health problems for people who can be support preventative or proper medical care. The chain of, the chain of events, food-oriented, is catastrophic. Diabetes, like we're seeing, obesity, that's just the symptoms, right, of something much deeper. It eats away at a person's self, 
esteem, sense of well-being goes on. So what can we do right now? From where I'm standing, it looks like farmers markets, who as a rule sell only locally grown produce, are the most direct and affordable route to fresh, locally grown food in our community. And that could mean farmers markets at the schools too. That sounds like a great idea to me. Right now, Gita and I are working on getting SNAP benefits accepted into more farmers markets here on Oahu. We're thinking about starting with the Hawaii Farm Bureau Farmers Markets because that's that's where we were and that's that's we're familiar with the vendors there, everything. But we we plan to move it throughout the community. And if you're not familiar with SNAP or food stamps and how that works, SNAP is the acronym for the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. It's pre previously known as the Hawaii Food Stamps Program. And it is managed um, very, it's managed by the USDA. So here's a snapshot of the scale of SNAP currently in Hawaii. In the fiscal year 2010, an average of 66,885 66, households in Hawaii were an average of 134,000 people, almost 134,000 people. That's about 12% of our population, and that's more than one in 10 of us. Think about this too, an average of um, $215 was allotted for each person each month. What this means, if you're looking at um, how economically, uh, how Hawaii could be affected economically if we were able to move more, um, more food stamps through our farmers markets, um, that, that amount translates to about, um, if, if USDA is, is funneling $29 million per month in SNAP benefits in the state of Hawaii alone. That means that kind of money could be funneled into our local food system. So what would it mean to everyone if just one out of $100 of SNAP benefits were spent in farmer's market? Just one dollar of every hundred. First, it would mean access, fresh locally grown food for low-income families, it would mean affecting people at a personal level, which is their bodies. And if my math is correct, it would be something to the tune of $290,000 per month invested into our local food system through direct purchases to farmers or to students. And I can't help but think of something environmentalist Bill McKibben wrote about in his book, Deep Economy. Is anyone familiar with Deep Economy? It's one of my favorite books. Okay, yeah. He said that every dollar spent at a farmer's market is estimated to stay in that local economy for at least three subsequent transactions before being subsequent away. So who would win in a situation like that? I think everybody. Right? I can't think of anybody who would be winning from a situation like having food stamps in the farmers markets. So what Ida and I have learned is that in order to have a food stamps program in the farmers markets um, be a long-standing community service, it, um, in this day and age of funding cuts, budget cuts, economy, economies falling, it would need to be built like a social business. So we're working on helping to build a social business model to get this community service um, started and, and uh, working for a long time. So I think we're going to need services like this for a long time. And it's not only, it's not only about um, getting something like this started, it's not only about keeping it going, it's also about how you can grow it. How can you keep it growing in a way that is responding to the needs of the community. So what we're thinking after looking at, okay, well, are you, are you setting out to just create a service or are we trying to achieve a mission? The mission being to, how do you create, or how do you, how do you open up, right, access to the most number of people 
and we started looking at exactly what we're doing. Okay, opening up the farmer's markets to take food stamps and EBT. But what about how much of the population who's low income also mobility challenged, right? Like physically challenged, cognitively challenged, um, well, cognitively challenged, and age-related challenged, right? So that's where the 2.0 comes in. We're thinking that what's needed is um, mobile farmers markets to go into the communities to bring the food to the people where it's most needed. Um, so Gideon and I are working on through the logical complications of doing something like this because the USDA uh, was just issued a uh, a stop um, on authorizing mobile operations and snap and stop to, for snap acceptance. So it's something that we're going to have to work through with them, but um, we're not letting that um, get in the way of um, knowing what needs to be done. So we're work going to be working with them on that. And in closing, I'd like to say then um, that I have, bring up one more point. In closing, I'd like to say that I've had the great fortune of living in culturally vibrant and famously low-income neighborhoods like Kalihi, like the Mission District of San Francisco, and for a time, the borough of Hackney in Northeast London. I have learned many things from living in these neighborhoods. The first is that everyone has had to start somewhere. Everyone needs help at one time or another. And often there was somebody there to lend a hand, is it a friend, a relative, a neighbor, or an entire community. People were there for each other. Another, another thing that I have learned is that the people who often have the least in terms of financial resources often bring the most to the table. This brings me to what I really want to say. That yes, I believe that it is imperative that low-income communities need to be given greater access to farmers' markets and locally grown food. But I also deeply believe that without the support and involvement of low-income communities, we will not be able to push forward in our local food system efforts. It is absolutely crucial that low-income communities not only gain access, but also be invited to become stakeholders in the discussions and the strategies to rebuild our local food system. Thank you.